Solving one-dimensional ordinary differential equations. This is a very important video because everything we've been talking about is going to come together. And I'll show you how to solve one-dimensional ordinary differential equations. And then we'll work through an actual example and I'll show you every single line of MATLAB code and what it would take to solve an ordinary differential equation. And given the technique I've been showing you, I think you'll be shocked at actually how simple the MATLAB code is and how easy it is to read. Solving one-dimensional ordinary differential equations. So of course, we will have to start off by defining our problem. So we are defining a differential equation here. We're defining an interval that we want to solve it in. And we're also providing boundary values. What's the function value at the very edge of the grid? So this is very representative of a typical problem that you would get in a textbook or a boundary value problems class, differential equations class. And so this is what we'll solve using the finite difference method. So we might ask, why on earth are the boundary values even needed? So here's our differential equation. And let's say we do this term by term thing to put it into matrix form. And we put it in its standard form in AX equals B. And so we derive a matrix A that has a second order derivative matrix plus five times the first order derivative matrix plus six times the identity matrix. But overall, our matrix equation now has this form and we have zeros on the right hand side, a column vector of zeros. So if we solve this, we bring the A matrix over to the other side. So F is A inverse times this column vector of zeros. That gives us a column vector of zeros. Well, that answer is no good. That's a trivial answer. And so we're not solving the problem actually. Well, when we incorporate the boundary values, instead of having a zero on the right-hand side of the matrix equation, we now have a column vector of something that's probably still mostly zeros, but has numbers at the boundary values. And so this becomes solvable. And also we've modified the matrix A in order to do that. So how do we incorporate the boundary values? Well, the first thing is we build our matrix equation just as we've done by starting with the differential equation, going term by term to put it in the matrix form, factor out the unknown and put it in the standard form. So we have matrix A and then a column vector of all zeros. At this point, we'll set up a loop and we'll loop over our boundary points or anywhere that has a known value in that function. So for a one dimension right now for us, it's the first and last point. But you know what? You might be solving a problem where something's known in the middle and that's perfectly fine too. That works. So for us, what we'll do is every point where there's a known value and that'll be the first and last, we're going to go into A and replace the entire row with all zeros. So we're throwing out whatever finite difference equation was there. We then place a one in the diagonal position or sometimes that's called the pivot position. Then we go into B and the element corresponding to that point, we place the boundary value there. So three things, zero out the row in A, place a one in the diagonal position, and then go put the actual boundary value in the column vector B. So now we have something that's solvable. We've modified our matrix A, right? Because we zeroed out rows, put ones in the diagonal position. We now have numbers here in our column vector B that's ready to be solved. And so we solve that through backward division, we will call it A inverse times B. So here's a good thing, good place to point out something important about this. It's easy to see this, and this is how we write it on paper to say, okay, let's calculate the inverse of A and then multiply by B. And that would get you your answer. So the MATLAB code would look something like this. That will absolutely work and get you your answer. However, it's a horrible, horrible thing to do. It is incredibly rare in linear algebra that we ever actually calculate the inverse of a matrix. So keep this in mind and anytime you're typing in inverse of a matrix suddenly become very paranoid that something's wrong because it's extremely rare to do that. Instead, this is a backward division. And so the correct line of MATLAB code would look like this. So A 
backward divide, it has the backward slash B. So we are really dividing B by A, but it's a pre-division. So A comes before it. This is the proper A. It's not actually ever calculating the inverse of A. It's shortcutting to A inverse times B, which is a much more efficient algorithm internally. So keep that in mind. I'll also mention for very large methods, this backward division is not necessarily the best way to do that. And iterative methods tend to become preferred. And what is large? Um, you know, that might be a grid that's a thousand by a thousand. Somewhere around there may be a cutoff of where backward division versus iterative, you know, becomes better. Uh, so really up to you to, to play with this and see which one's better. But however, if we use an iterative approach, then the conditioning, remember we talked about the health of matrices, that becomes very important. Finite difference method has very sparse matrices that tends not to be real great for conditioning. And so then we get into more advanced concepts like preconditioning and other things. Suffice to say in this class, everything we're gonna do, backward division will work just fine. And we really have to get to a quite large problem before this backward division causes you problems. But when it does, now you know we, what to think about, iterative methods, conditioning of A, and other things. Given all that, let's work through an example and let's look at every single line of MATLAB code to solve a differential equation. So here's the differential equation we've been working with. So we got our differential equation. We have the integral we're solving it in, and we have the boundary value. So that's the function at the end points. So in MATLAB, uh, I would love to be able to define this differential equation up front, but that'll come in later when we type in the matrix A. But for now, we can type in the start and end points and our boundary values, the function value at those end points. So this would come up at the start of our program. Now we're on paper, we're not in code right now. We want to formulate this matrix A so that we can go to standard form. So we look at our differential equation on paper and we go term by term. And remember that the functions and whatever's on the right-hand side, the excitation or the constants, those are the column vectors. Everything else will become a square matrix. So we go term by term and we write that. Once we're there, we factor out our unknown F and we're just about into standard form. We recognize that this is our matrix A. So we go ahead and write the standard form. And this is the formulation. This is what's done on paper. And with practice, you'll be able to just look at that differential equation and just imagine what this A matrix is, right? Second order derivative plus five times the first order plus six times the identity matrix. And I can just see that now. I have enough practice with this. Anyway, this is not very bad steps to do on paper until you're practiced with it. So that happens on paper. We're now formulated. We're ready to jump back to MATLAB. So before we can build matrices, we have to calculate our grid. How many points are on this grid N and what's the grid spacing delta X? So for now, we have to make a guess and we'll choose 11 points. We would like to make a good guess and in electromagnetics, for example, I might know the wavelength that I'm simulating and I know that I probably wanna resolve that with at least 10 points. Um, other physics have different requirements. If there's anything, any kind of information about the problem that will give you some kind of good guess, make that. Otherwise, just make a guess. And right here, we don't really know anything about that differential equation. So, you know, we're just pulling the value of 11 out of nowhere. So that's where we'll start and we'll get the problem solved and then we'll do a convergence study to actually figure out really how many points we need. Given 11 points, we can calculate the spacing, right? It's B minus A divided by the number of points minus one. That gives us 0 0.2 for delta X. So in MATLAB, we will define our number of points and then calculate the grid resolution. We would like to build this matrix A, but before that, we have to build our matrix operators. And so we have our two derivative matrices. We have a first order and second order derivative matrix, and we have our identity matrix. Remember, I'm showing these as full matrices, 
but they're actually always sparse matrices. We're only ever working with sparse matrices here. So in MATLAB, this is easy. We use the SPI command. So that's the sparse identity matrix and it's NX by NX, the matrix size. And then we will call a function that here I'm calling FDDER1D. We give it the size of the grid or number of points and the resolution. And it goes ahead and builds these derivative matrices. So this will actually be a homework problem, but let's think briefly what's in here. Remember this first order and second order derivative matrix. The first order, there's two diagonals. So we call SP diags twice and then divide by one over two delta X. This second order derivative matrix has three diagonals. That would be three calls to SP diags. And then we divide by delta X squared. And that's essentially all the code that there is in this FDDER1D function, which means finite difference derivatives 1D grid. That's sort of my uh, code there that I put in that function title. But all the tediousness of the finite difference method is absorbed into this function. The rest of the code is going to read very clean. And we can just literally type in any differential equation we want because they all share the same derivative matrices. Okay, now we're in a position to build our matrix equation, at least the initial matrix equation. And I call it the initial matrix equation because we'll have to change it when we incorporate the boundary values. So our matrix A is simply the second order derivative matrix plus five times the first order derivative matrix plus six times the identity matrix. And when I do all that, here's the matrix that I get for my 11 points. And I'm initializing B right now to just all zeros. That's easy to do in MATLAB. And here's where I feel like I'm literally typing in the differential equation. This is your superpower. So we are doing our finite differences in a way that at least in the MATLAB code, we don't even really see that there's finite differences happening. And that's really cool. It makes the codes very simple and it makes it very quick when we type in a new differential equation. And then we're initializing B to a sparse column vector. That's NX by one. Remember our matrices are NX by NX, where NX is the number of points on the grid. So our column vector is NX by one. Now we want to incorporate the boundary values. Remember what happens here. We're going to zero out the rows in A, which have our boundary values. So that's the first and last row. And we're going to insert a one in the diagonal position in those rows or the, the pivot position. The second thing we do is go over to B and we insert numbers where the boundary values are. I should have said that was the third thing we do. First thing is zeroing out the rows in A. Second thing, inserting ones in the diagonal positions. And then the third thing, putting the actual boundary values in our column vector B. Here's what that might look like. So in one line of code, I am zeroing out two rows. I'm zeroing out the first row and the last row. And this colon means zero out the entire row. We're putting all zeros in there. Then I wanna go and insert ones in the diagonal position. So we have this first one up here and that's in the one, one position. So that's a one. And then we have the second one in the NX by NX position. That's right here and we stick in a one. Then we have to go ahead and insert our boundary values into the first and last element in B. And here's how I do that B and I'm giving it two arguments, the first point and last point, and then the first boundary value and the last boundary value. So four lines of code, and we've incorporated our boundary values and our problems ready to solve. So that's what we do here. And we solve this as F equals A inverse B. But remember, we're not actually calculating an inverse here. Any time in code you're calculating an inverse of a matrix, tri triple, quadruple, rethink that because it's probably not what you should be doing. It's incredibly rare to calculate matrix inverses. So F is A backward divide B. Shortest line of code in your whole program, but actually computationally, this is the most expensive. Now, not so much for an 11 point grid, but the reality is you'll be dealing with grids that have tens of thousands of points. And this line of code still looks the same, but runs the slowest. All right, once that's done, we have our answer and we could stare at numbers all day. That doesn't mean anything, but we're gonna go ahead and plot it. So there's our answer. Mentally, you know, we can sort of connect these with lines and, but we're not done. This just means that our code runs without error. 
that does not mean that's the correct solution. It does not mean that we're done. What's next? Next is the conversion study. Never ever think you've done a problem and never ever submit a final answer until you've done a conversion study. So what I'm doing here is I'm increasing the number of points on the grid and I'm running my program over and over and I'm plotting the answer. And notice it's crazy at first, but at some point I'm getting essentially the same answer. And so I'm picking right around here, you know, about 20 points on the grid seems to be where my program converges. And there's not really a strong need to go to more and more points. And in fact, it said, if we keep going at some point, when we have so many points, we're going to be introducing errors again because we have more calculations than is necessary. I'll admit, I've never experienced that happening. I've never added so many points that things start to fall apart again. Um, but when that does happen, supposedly, uh, that's also when iterative methods become more accurate than just a direct backward division. But again, I've never experienced that. So we've checked for convergence, still not done. We need to run that very last simulation, unless we've saved our answers along the way, at the converged number of points, which was around 20. So here's the result when we use 20 points and generated a nice professional plot. That's another important thing. And here's my code that I use to generate this professional plot. Never plot just crude things or what automatically comes out of MATLAB. And there's a lot here, and we've been through this before, but we're looking at consistent number of digits here, right? We're not saying 0 0.5 and then just a one here. So the one would be offset from the position it should be in. We're using correct math symbols here, using the LaTeX interpreter, uh, thick enough lines, all that stuff we've thought about. And the code for doing that is here. Now, we may not be done then. All we have is a correct answer, but it's very rare that we just calculate the function. Normally, if we're doing something in physics or science, we're gonna get that, but then we're going to post-process it. We're going to analyze it and learn something from it. Maybe we wanna know where that peak occurs or something else. So that's called post-processing. And it's not even necessarily part of the finite difference method. The finite difference method gave us that solution and then we process the solution after there to learn everything else that we want to learn. Just to show you how simple it is, here is everything all together other than the nice fancy graphics code I used to generate that. But here's the definition of the problem and here's our entire MATLAB program. This is incredible. Look how simple and short that is. And we have actually solved a differential equation using a numerical technique, the finite difference method. So we defined our bounds, where what our boundary conditions are. We set up our grid with our converged number of points, 20. We then built our derivative matrices and our identity matrix, so that's our matrix operators. We built the initial matrix equation. We incorporated the boundary values, and then we solved it. And I guess I'm not showing it here, but then we plotted it too. But, but this is it, we have our solution. And looking at this code, I think this is incredible and just, Look how simple it is now if I were to give you a completely different differential equation. Well, you might type in different bounds and different boundary values, probably would need to choose a different number of points, and you type in a different differential equation. But how quickly could you do that? 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and now you have an entirely new solution. I think that's incredible, and that's why I like this finite difference method. If we use the conventional approach, it would be a whole lot more work to set it up for a new problem. And so I absolutely love solving problems this way, using the finite difference method this way. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.